Good morning, Southam. Will you stand and worship with us today?
morning, Southland. On behalf of the Elder Board, my name is Jeff Griffith, and I'm a part of our Elder Board here at Southland. Um, and I just want to take a time this week uh, as part of Volunteers Week uh, to just thank our volunteers here at this church. We have so many people volunteering here in worship and our tech department, uh, in child care, in youth ministry, children's ministry. So can we just get a quick round of applause for everyone here serving in those roles behind the scenes? Yeah, it goes a long way. Amen. Uh, I know personally, being able to be a part of a certain minute, a few ministries here, uh, it's meant the world to me to see just the way the body works and the way that people can get involved uh, and be a part of something amazing here uh, in serving in the ways they're gifted. So uh, if you're ca feeling called or feeling something on your heart or an area of gifting to serve here at Southland, I'd encourage you to go out into the hub or look for opportunities on our website, southlandchurch.org, for how you can serve and volunteer and be a part of uh, all the beautiful things guys doing here at Southland. Um, real quick before we continue to worship, will you all just bow your heads in prayer with me? me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for this body of believers uh, and for the ways you've gifted so many people here um, to serve and make this, uh, this church, this, um, this community work so well to honor you and glorify you. God, we pray that you would be calling up individuals into roles of leadership, into roles of ministry, uh, into roles of service, God, to just bring glory to you and draw others to you through the ways you've gifted them and designed them. God, we thank you for the ways you've done that in so many lives. Uh, I just pray that you continue to grow this church, grow opportunities, grow uh, leaders and followers of you through the work being done here. So we thank you, Lord, and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. After King Solomon finished building the temple of God, he spread his hands to the heavens and dedicated to God, saying, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love, your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way.
we, when we come together like this in this space and we sing these songs of praise that are so full of joy, uh, it just reminds us of what we have to be joyful uh, about. It, it's the fact that we came here in the name of Jesus Christ who came to this world to give himself up for us. And so we love to celebrate that as a sacrament, as Jesus told us to in his word. And, and so we ask all believers who want to participate in communion here at Southland to get a packet when you come in. And if you didn't get one when you come in, but you want to take communion, if you just put your hand up and one of our servers will make sure that you have a packet so you can be part of this. Those of you who are with us online, we encourage you as well to get some, some bread or cracker and juice so that you can be part of this worship experience too. I, I always remember the story of Jesus sharing this Last Supper with his with his disciples, and, and we forget sometimes the mention that they were celebrating what they called the Passover meal, and that was to remember what God did for the Israelites when he had them put blood over the doorpost and the death angel then would not attack them. And this is is same for us with Jesus Christ's blood, shed so that we could have forgiveness and eternal life and eternal hope. And so Jesus asked his disciples to carry that on through history. So here we are, thousands of years later, celebrating that with them. Because on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat it. Do this in remembrance of me. If you open up the smaller end of your packet, you'll find a piece of bread there. Eat it, remembering the broken body of Jesus for you. And then a little while later, he took a cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant poured out for you. Take and drink it. Do this in remembrance of me. Let me drink. Let's pray together. Our oh Lord, we're so grateful for your broken body, your shed blood, that kind of love and sacrifice that you demonstrated on the cross when you came to this world. And what we're also so grateful for is that has meaning to us because we know the tomb is empty, we know you've risen from the dead, and this is the hope you've promised us. So we come before you in worship. We're not worthy to be in your presence, but you have made it possible through what you did for us on the cross, that suffering, that sacrifice, so that we could live. And so thank you for this gift, this hope, that no matter what we face in this world, you have conquered death and the grave. And Lord, you didn't stop there. You told us to come boldly to the throne of grace, to find mercy and grace, to help us in our time of need. And there are men and women in this room and with us online who need a touch from heaven. Some have gotten a diagnosis that they didn't expect. And we pray for your healing power in Jesus' name. We pray for strength, for confidence in your love. There's some people here that need guidance, Lord, big decisions coming up. We pray that through your word and your spirit, you would guide people's steps. Or we have relationships that are breaking and we need you to heal them. We ask you to do that. There's so much that we need to bring to you and ask for you to provide and we do it confidently. And we say thank you, Lord, for loving us enough to die for us, for giving us your spirit. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's sing this together. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, you have more, sins they are many, His mercy is more. South, would you stand with us together as we lift this up together? Thank you. All-knowing, he counts not their son, thrown in. 
into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the
article where uh, they, they used an illustration of a young teacher in a church who had a class full of nine-year-old boys, and she decided that she wanted to help those nine-year-old boys become uh, aware of or acquainted with their pastor, so she told them they could all write him letters. And in that letter, they were able to tell them about themselves or ask questions of their pastor. And that's what you want, right? You want your nine-year-old writing a letter to your pastor telling all about himself, including you. Uh, that make you nervous. But, but this one little boy uh, wrote to the pastor, and he said this, Dear pastor, he said, We say grace every night before dinner, even when we have leftovers from the night before. Now, you pause there and you say, wait a minute, some things do need prayed for twice. But he didn't understand why you had to pray for it again if you already prayed for it the first time. Well, I want to tell you is that what we struggle with is realizing that we should pray the first time. That praying is a big part of what Jesus wants us to know. And so he told us how important it was. Now, that's what this series has been all about, this theme we have this year of what he said. And we're talking about what he said about being serious with God. And today, I want to find out what he said about prayer because that's when we understand being serious with God. Now, the last two weeks, we talked about baptism and worship two things that are really important to our walk with God as we uh, take him seriously and learn the life he wants to live. Well, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount talked a lot to us about real life, and that's where I want to take us today. So if you have a Bible or a device with the Bible on it, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6, which is the middle chapter of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7. And it's interesting when you read this thing from start to finish, those three chapters, you'll find out Jesus really understood real life. And that's what he was addressing in that sermon. He talked about anger. He talked about sexual purity. He talked about marriage and divorce, about vows, about revenge and loving your enemies and giving to the needy. And that's just part of it. I mean, he went on. He talked about materialism and what causes us to worry. He talked about judging and being judged. And we all know what that feels like and what we're to build our lives upon. He, he talked in this whole sermon about stuff we think about every single day. But here's what's so amazing is that right in the middle of it, where he's hitting all these topics in life application, he puts this teaching on prayer. And I want us to get it. So if, if let's just read it together. Uh, verse 5 of chapter 6. Uh, I'll put it up on the screen for you if you didn't bring your Bible. And, and here's what he said. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everybody can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. And then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. And, and when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Now, those of you who learned that prayer uh, also then think, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The, the fact is, that's been added in later manuscripts. It's not in the oldest manuscripts, but listen, you can go ahead and keep praying that. That's fine. But, but I want to unpack all that he had to say, because, because look at it here. Jesus teaches from the assumption that we all pray that we all understand that we have this innate characteristic that we want to connect with God. He's put that in us. And prayer is one method he's offered to us as a gift. Now, when you put it together with what we talked about last week in worship, you realize how amazing it is that the creator of the universe has made himself available to you. 
Now, I often ask you to pause and think about that when you consider not just the earth itself and how small we are on this planet, but how small we are in terms of all of creation and the billions of galaxies out there. And yet that God is teaching us how to pray, how to connect with him. I think it's pretty special. I think it's pretty important. I think it's frankly awesome that he offers that to us. So that's why Jesus teaches us, <clears throat> and get this, pray so you'll know him privately. Now, I want you to grasp that aspect of what he said here. When you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your father in private. See, one thing Jesus was dealing with at this time is that there were all of these religious leaders who were just full of arrogance, and he was trying to get the, get them out of that spiritual arrogance so that they could ultimately believe who he was and trust him. So these guys would pray these public professional prayers intended to impress the people around them. You know, they were all very gifted and smooth talkers and they used big flowery Hebrew words. And the whole idea wasn't just so people would look at them, but also so they could show people that they were smarter than them, more spiritual than them, so they could main, con maintain control over them. And while they could recite the laws and rituals, they had no idea who God was or how to relate to him. This is why Jesus dialed in on private, secret prayer. Not only was he exposing the true hearts of these religious leaders, but look, he was opening up the hearts and minds of regular people, and they were discovering that he, they could actually pray to God. They could actually approach God themselves. They didn't have to be one of these hotshot religious leaders who had these powerful professional prayers. He showed that the God of the universe wants you to come to him, not for show, not to impress him even with your spiritual disciplines, but for honest and sincere connection. Men and women, this is what true prayer is all about. Now, when we're with God in private, the mask falls off. In other words, I know he knows who I am and what I've done and what's been done to me. And we can be honest with him about all of that. It's when I'm open and honest with him about who I am that he will reveal who he is to me. If I'll take advantage of this amazing gift that he gives us, this gift of prayer. And by the way, Jesus wasn't condemning these religious leaders because they prayed in public. He was revealing to them the true condition of their hearts. They knew they were only praying for show and to protect their reputations as being spiritual leaders. To them and to others listening and to you, he says, go to the Lord in secret prayer, in private prayer, and there you'll find him to worship him, to honor him, to hear from him, to trust him, and here it is, to obey. Because ultimately there is no greater expression of you trusting God than to obey his words that he gives you for life. Now, it might bring up the question note in your mind, well then, wait a minute, is it okay to pray public prayers? Well, I'm just going to tell you this, I hope so because I just did. I hope that's okay, but the fact is, Scripture has all kinds of examples where leaders in the church were actually praying prayers God led them to pray. For instance, if you go to Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit filled the hearts of the disciples and they went out into the streets and preached the gospel, after that, Peter led an amazing prayer of, for all of the people. They were actually encouraged to gather together to pray. And we do it often here. I mean, we have small groups, and we have classes, and our leadership gathers together and prays. I mean, we even get together on Zoom on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock every single week because we see the value of praying. You don't even have to leave your house uh, to pray together with other people. You can just log on to southlandchurch.org and hit the global prayer experience at 7 o'clock, and you're praying with us. All of that is good, but we never 
Let those times of corporate prayer replace the private, secret, personal prayers of our lives. That's when we connect and commune with the Lord. Now, notice Jesus says, then your Father who sees everything will reward you. Now, this culture was all about honor versus shame. I mean, that was pretty much every socioeconomic political group of that time. I mean, your goal was to go out there and be talked well about in public. You know, and, but then the same thing could happen. If you were shamed, that was tragic. And so they were doing all they could to avoid that. Jesus is saying, you'll be rewarded by the Father for praying in secret, and he corrected that cultural belief. You no longer have to seek the approval of people to find your identity and your worth. The Lord will affirm your value to him in the secret place of prayer. Your reward is God's honor versus the reward of some public pontification reaping the cynical honor of people. And we all do that, right? I mean, when we see people who are full of themselves and we go by and we say, hey, yeah, right. I mean, we're just feeling that kind of sarcasm toward them. You don't need any of that. When you come to God privately and pour out your heart to him. So Jesus helps us to understand if you want to know God and you want to actually know yourself well, go to him in private and establish a consistent, purposeful prayer life. I, I, I sometimes talk about college and, and going to Bible college when I first graduated from, from, school, from high school. And, and there in Bible college, the very first book they gave me in the very first class I attended was a book by a guy named E.M. Bounds called The Power of Prayer. It's a great little book, and I thought to myself, why would they give this to us first? Why is this the most important thing that they think we need? Well, it's just that. Prayer should be the center of every aspect of your life. It's not just for the professional clergy types. I mean, they were given this book to everybody because they wanted everybody to understand developing a prayer life will be so foundation foundational not only to your walk with God, but in the way you live your life day in and day out. It's the most important thing. And if we're talking about getting serious with God, I'm just here to tell you, there's no bigger thing than establishing the importance of praying in your life. Now, why do some find it difficult to focus in prayer? Why do some find it hard to make time to pray. And you know what, if, if people were honest, I bet hands would go up all around this room to say, you know what, that's, I, I think it's hard to pray. I don't even know how to pray. I don't, sometimes don't even feel like praying. Why is that? Well, here's, it's clear in the Bible. Because you have a spiritual adversary, a spiritual enemy, and he's constantly throwing at you distractions. He's constantly putting other things on your mind rather than praying. Why? Because he knows that that's the number one most powerful thing in your walk with God is your prayer life. And so when you can't bring yourself to praying, that's not surprising to me. I've had the same struggles and the same temptation and the same burden because I allow other things to come before my understanding of prayer with the Lord. Now, my question to myself and to you is, will you win this battle? Will you even today, this morning, this is what I prayed for for today, that you would come in here and hear what Jesus had to say about prayer and make a decision that you're going to make it the most important thing in your life, the thing that will be the foundation of every other thing in your life. Jesus wasn't guilting people to pray, nor am I. I'm just sitting here telling you of this amazing opportunity that the God of the universe wants to meet with you anytime, any place, for any reason that you're going through. Now, look at this. Go back to verse 7 again. Let me read a couple of verses that we already read. Verse 7, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do, they think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. You see, he's telling us 
to pray like you need him. Like you need him. Pray desperately. I mean, care about the things that you're bringing to him. Well, first of all, he says, don't do it because that's what the Gentiles do. I mean, what is a Gentile? Who uses that word? Well, only the Bible. Because a Gentile was any person who wasn't part of the Jewish faith. Basically, any other religion, any, any person non-religious, they just referred to all non-Jewish people as Gentiles. And the religious practice of non-Jews at this time was really diverse. If a Gentile was religious, they would simply follow the practices of whatever their idols' expectations were, whatever the priests in their temples of idol worship would tell them to do. And it might include incantations or repetitive statements or meaningless sounds, basically mindless and purposeless babbling, babbling. That's Jesus' word, not mine. So I'm not sitting here criticizing. I'm just telling you, this is how Jesus summed up when you try to impress God by just repeating a bunch of words that someone taught you to say. He wasn't saying we shouldn't regularly and passionately bring our needs to him, sometimes more than once. Jesus actually taught that we should pound on the door of heaven when we have a crisis or a need, that we should come to him often and with concern, desperation, if you will. See, rather, he's saying the repetitive rituals of pagan worship accomplish nothing with the one true God that you're actually seeking in worship and prayer. His counsel? Don't be like them. It's not the ritual of prayer, but the content of prayer that connects you to the heart of God. It's not the fact that you're doing your duty, because that's not what prayer is. It's the fact that you're bringing all that you are honestly to him and seeking his face and his help and guidance. And Jesus says he knows what you need, but wants to see your faith demonstrated by bringing those needs to him in transparent, honest, meaningful prayer. Here's the important question, and, and, and you got to get this. What is the goal of your prayers? I mean, why am I coming to God at this moment asking him to help me? Is it to check off one of your daily spiritual disciplines, meaning that you just relegated it to a ritual in your life? Is it so God will do what you want him to do? God, here's my list. Take care of this. I hope you can get this all done in the next 24 hours. Or is it for you to communicate your complete dependence upon God's grace and his presence in your life? That's what he's going for. And Jesus makes it clear, God already knows what you need before you ever ask him. So your prayers become your expression of faith in him as the provider of your needs and the object of your trust and your true worship. It's not just a ritual we teach you to perform, but a sacred act he offers you to elevate your faith to levels that truly connect you to him. Now, hey, while we're talking about college, I'm just going to keep going with that theme. Um, when I was in college, 20 years old, I went to a little town in Pennsylvania called Johnstown, did an internship there one summer, great uh, church, great pastor there to learn from, and they had me live with this older lady. She was in her late 70s, and, and so her name was Dorothy, a wonderful woman, but I, it was interesting because they were giving me these warnings like, Steve, she really is, like, all about the spiritual. And she, all she wants to talk about, she's kind of fanatical about spirit things and prayer and all of that. We just want you to know that. And I'm like, hey, that's cool. If I'm going to live with a woman, it might as well be a spiritual one, right? And that, they would joke all the time that we were living together. And, and, and what, what, what was interesting is anytime I would have some concern, it could be big, it could be little, uh, they would always say that she will take you to prayer. And guess what? She did. I mean, if I mentioned anything, we were going to pray about it. And I'll never forget the morning. It was going to be my first sermon on a Sunday morning as a 20-year-old intern to this, this church. And I'm just going to tell you something. I was really, really nervous. 
Uh, not as ner nervous as I am every Sunday morning preaching to you freaks, but I mean, I was really, really nervous. And, and so he, here's the thing. She decided that I needed her to pray for me before I left. And she sat me on this little high chair that she used for her great-grandchildren when they were over. It was not comfortable. And then she put her hands on my curly head. Yes, it was curly at one time. And she began to pray for me and pray and pray and pray. And I mean, the, the, the whole fear, all of that began to melt away the lack of confidence, any question that I could say something that God would use it to somehow speak to somebody's heart. I mean, she prayed and prayed so much so that I have to be honest with you as she's got her hands on me praying and I mean, tight grip, I wasn't getting out of there. I was concerned that we were going to be late for church and it helps when you're the preacher to not be late for church. But here, the beauty of it is that the beauty of remembering Dorothy's prayers is that it wasn't the last thing she thought of doing, it was the first. No matter what the issue was, she was going to start with praying. And I mean, it, you know, it, isn't that true? What, what happens when we have a need? What's our first inclination? Is it complaining or worrying or whining or criticizing or even strategizing? Is that all our first inclination? Jesus says when you have a need, start with prayer. Dorothy got that. Dorothy taught that to me. And I'm praying that God will help me to continue to remember that in my life. Bring your need to God, listen, as an offering. Because he wants you to trust him. And when you bring your stuff to him, you're showing him that you trust him with your prayers. Now, it's interesting because then Jesus at this moment began to teach them something we now call the Lord's Prayer because he was, he was talking to a lot of people who had no clue what it meant to pray to God because they kind of delegated that to these religious guys with their professional prayers. And they didn't even realize that they could approach the Lord themselves. And so he taught them how to pray. His disciples, later it's recorded in Luke, even said, Lord, teach us to pray, and this is the prayer he taught them. Now understand this, though. This prayer wasn't meant to be something that we ritualistically quote or pray. It's meant to be an outline for you as a tool to help you know how to pray, just like he was teaching them, he's teaching us. So I'm, maybe, maybe you learned of this prayer. Uh, growing up, in maybe VBS between your Oreo and your Kool-Aid or something, you learned this prayer. I want us all to quote it together, and we'll use the word trespasses because a lot of different words are used for, for sins there. And, and let's just pray it together, even, even, I, even as I said, it's not meant to be quoted, but I want you to quote it so you have it in your mind. All right, here it is. Say it with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Then go ahead and say it. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. See, so in other words, he gives you this outline where he says, start with worship, hallowed be your name, recognizing he's holy, and declare to him that what he wants for this world is what you want, his kingdom, to come in your life and in this space, in his timing. And then he, to, my desire is to know his will and his design. So that's what I'm praying for, and that's what the prayer gives us as an outline. And then he says, and bring your needs to him. Pray for those needs. Give us today our daily bread. And then here's the big one. Confess. I mean, honestly, confess your temptations, your sins, your failures, your weaknesses. Bring all of that reality to God honestly and openly. But hey, don't stop there praying for your own sins but also pray for the people you need to forgive. I, I just want to tell you this. Write this down. Put it in your mind. Always remember this. It's hard to stay mad at someone you're praying you'll forgive. It's hard to. The people you're praying for are hard to dislike. 
if you keep praying for God to bless, encourage, forgive, and help them. Look, look, this is a prayer that you can work through in your secret place, showing your dependence upon him. Now, let me take you to Jesus' example of part of this because there's a story in later on in Matthew, in Matthew 26, where Jesus is with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night he was betrayed. And he tells his disciples to sit over here and watch for him and pray for him while he goes off by himself to pray. And he asks them to stand in the gap on his behalf. And here's what happens. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 38. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And he went on a little farther and bowed his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet not what I want, but your will be done. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. You see, he's telling us to pray like it matters, just like he did, submissively. And this is where it gets tough, right? Because when we come to God, we want to be able to just give him our litany of requests, and we expect him to deliver, not say, Lord, here's what I believe I need, here's what I need you to do, but ultimately, your will be done. Now, if you continue reading, you'll see that Jesus prayed this way two more times, and that's because submission requires surrender. See, that's really the question here, right? Is have I, in fact, trusted God enough to surrender my entire life to his leadership? Am I truly coming to him in prayer with that kind of attitude so that whatever he has for me to accomplish for his glory, I'm willing to do it? See, submission is also recognizing and trusting God's design and will is your ultimate goal to accomplish. This is the greatest purpose and goal of prayer, getting yourself into the mental and spiritual place of submission to the Lord. Now, the disciples actually pull back the curtain in this moment and show us who they really are because after three years with Jesus, they still haven't come to fully understand his purpose, and frankly, they didn't understand their own purpose. And, and when he explains the seriousness of this moment, all they could do was fall asleep. I mean, have you ever been there before? Where you know prayer is absolutely the best thing for you in a moment, and yet you default to distractions or fatigue or substitutions most of all. Now, you're in good company since at the most critical moment in the history of the universe, they couldn't keep their eyes open or their minds focused, and that was his disciples. Now, I didn't mean to say, so you can feel better about yourself because you've been distracted or you're continuing to be. No, I'm saying overcome it with an understanding that it's real and that it fights against you. Later, they would understand and submit themselves to their own violent deaths for his glory. Now, this is the attitude he teaches us to embrace when we approach the Lord in prayer. Show me what you want me to do and empower me to do it. So let me explain it this way with my final college illustration. When I was in school, we had this thing called Change the World School of Prayer. And this guy named Dick Eastman came to our campus, and he put us through this, this really this great lesson in how to pray and how important prayer is. And Dick wrote a book called The Hour That Changes the World. And I just want you to, there, in, it, in that book, there was this wheel of prayer, and it, and it really is so helpful because the hour that changes the world, I mean, none of us thought we could pray for an hour. Well, I'm going to put it up here on the screen for you. Ask him to put it up there for you. So you can see it starts and ends with praise. You start there in that little purple one at the top, and you work around to the right, and it just gives you, what if you just did five minutes on each one of those little blocks? Now, look, I've passed this out many times, and it's become a tool for people to use as they think about praying. If you say to yourself, I just don't know what to do, here it is. It's an opportunity to guide you by saying, look, 
Start with praise and worship. Sing to him. Just talk to him. Honor him. Hallowed be thy name. And then stop and listen for a minute and wait and ask him to give you the prayers to pray. Go on with confession. Maybe read the Bible out loud. You could start with the Psalms right there and go around the circle and just pray. Even if it's a minute on each one, 12 minutes might be more than maybe you've been praying up to this point. The whole idea isn't to give you some kind of ritual, but rather to give you a tool. So when you leave today, you can stop by the little black table that's standing at each door as you go out, and there's a stack of these wheels. And you can just take one and put it on your bedside or wherever your secret place will be for prayer. And you can just use it as a guide to help you begin to connect with the Lord. I just want to not only encourage you to do things and teach you to do things, I want to do my best to give you the tools to help you do those things. So grab one or a couple if you want to share them with other people. Those of you who are online, just talk to us in the chat. Give us some information so we can send it to you as well. We're glad to do email it to you if you need it. Here's the thing. The more you worship and listen and meditate in prayer, the more you will grow in your faith because of who you're praying to. Make a decision right now that you're going to try your best to find a place and time to pray every day. Make a commitment to that, to yourself and to the Lord. And pick a time and a spot in secret. And to get started, take the wheel with you. And maybe just let that guide you or let the Lord's Prayer guide you in, in, from the passage. And take a Bible with you as is encouraged with the tool. And again, I'd encourage you to open it up to the Psalms and you'll see the true heart of people who are just crying out to God. I mean, all the time in the Psalms, you see people getting real with God. They're not interested in flowery language. They're just interested in bearing their soul to the Lord. And then be honest. Look, you, you know you can't keep secrets from God. So you might as well go into that moment being honest, confessing your sins, seeking his help over your greatest failures, weaknesses, and temptations. And then listen, thank him in advance for answering your prayers. Because those answers are coming. And remember what's the ultimate goal? To honor the Lord, even if it requires your suffering to accomplish it. Now look, today I only touched on a few examples from the Bible as to how to help you grow in prayer. And I don't know, maybe down the road here we'll do another series on it so you can continue to develop that. Because I mean what I said at the beginning, there really is nothing more important in your life than prayer, than your one-on-one -on -one personal connection with the Lord. And it wasn't meant, as I said before, to guilt you, rather to encourage you and hand you this incredible gift of the God of the universe. But look, I, I want you to understand there, even if there are many more things that Jesus said, I want you to know what he did was come to the Lord in prayer. Now think about that. I'll speak for myself. I won't speak for all y'all. I'll just speak for me. And I'll say, if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, needed to pray, I definitely need prayer in my life. And if you're going to be serious with God, become a person who makes prayer a priority. Not because I told you to, and not even because wonderful people that you respect are great at praying, but because it's what he said, and it's a big thing that he wants you to know and experience. Let's pray together. Oh, Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to know that when we bow our heads and begin to talk to you, you hear every word. And you know the depths of our heart, and you know our distractions, and you know the competition that's out there for our minds and our souls. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us in this moment to commit ourselves to daily prayer, to commit ourselves to hear your voice and let you speak into us. 
to commit ourselves to honest confession, to seek your face and forgiveness, and so you will help us to forgive. Lord Jesus, we ask you like your disciples asked you, teach us to pray. Go ahead, you pray your own prayer in response to what you've heard this morning. Ask the Lord to help you become a prayer. Lord Jesus, when it's all said and done and my time on earth is finished, what I wanted to accomplish more than anything is to know you and to make you known. So I pray you would increase my desire for praying, for connecting with you, for knowing you, worshiping you, loving you, and serving you. And I pray that you would put that into the hearts of every person in this room today that you would help us to long for nothing more than to seek you and find you by seeking you with all our hearts. So we give ourselves to you to that end for the glory of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's stand and let's continue to worship and let your worship be a prayer to the Lord.
ocean he'll never let me down i put my faith in jesus my anchor to the ground my hope and firm foundation he'll never let me down i put my faith in jesus my anchor to the ground my hope So if you're thinking to yourself, you know, I really don't have a lot of needs and a lot of stuff I need to pray for. Just go ahead and pray for me because I have a lot. And I would love to have you calling out my name to the Lord, the, the, the ministries of our church, the other people in your life. Take advantage of this incredible gift. Hey, we mentioned earlier in the service that Saturday night, we're going to have a night of worship. This Well Worship Band and others who are part of the Well Worship Ministry are going to be here Saturday night at 7. There's a little card on your seat. Uh, that's for you to be reminded, but also it's for you to invite somebody. I hope you'll come out Saturday night and be part of that worship experience. It should be a great time together. Uh, that's for you guys online as well. I hope you'll do that. Now, here's another thing. Uh, next Sunday, I, I can't encourage you enough to be here. Uh, it's going to be our missions mid-year service and a lady named Esther Chung, who is North Korean but lives in China and does amazing work of bringing the gospel to people in North Korea and China, I, I really want you to come hear her, tell her story. She speaks Mandarin, so we'll have a translator here for her. I mentioned her about a month ago in a sermon, and her, her story is so unbelievable, and you will be both challenged and encourage next Sunday. So please be here and invite every man, woman, child, dog, and cat to come with you uh, for, for that service. And one more thing, uh, the first Sunday of May, it's our 15th anniversary. Can you believe that? I can. It's a, what a celebration. Yeah. And so we're going to do like the track and we're going to celebrate all through the month of May. And uh, one of the ways we're doing that is we're asking people in the church to pray for an anniversary gift to give to the mortgage above and beyond all of the other things that you already give to. So go home and pray about that. And uh, we, we just are looking, ho hoping for a huge miracle in May that will ultimately pay this whole thing off. So you just pray about it. Ask the Lord, what do you want you to give? And then just do that. Just respond and give what he tells you to give. Thanks for being with us online. Stick around for just a minute. Ben's going to talk a little bit more about how you can respond to what you experienced in worship today at Southland. I'm grateful that you're here. Hope to see you back here in person. God bless you. Have a great week.